So welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Ken Brickley, who's the CEO of Macroactive. And Ken has got this huge kind of experience, everything from working in large businesses like GE, right the way to starting his own startup. So he's got a huge amount of experience to share with us. Hey, welcome, Ken. Thanks for having me, Deborah. Hey, it's great to see you. It's been a while. I'm looking forward to when we can actually catch up in person again. I know. I can't wait. <laughs> it's been a long time. Hey, Ken, would you mind, before we get started, could you share a professional and a personal best with me so our listeners can get a bit of a sense of the man, Ken? All right. Well, um, gosh, I, I think uh, a personal has got to be my family. I won the lottery um, uh, with my family, uh, extended family, uh, uh, around the world and, um, and, and here in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, two incredibly clever kids, um, uh, incredible stepdaughter and a uh, loving partner. I mean, I, yeah, I've got to listen, uh, uh, an extended in-laws that I, I, I love and, you know, you can't get better than that. Um, I, I, I think maybe best, um, I've been known to wake myself up laughing. So um, that may give you some sort of insight into like what goes on in my head, but you know, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a highlight. Um, Professionally, listen, I love what I do. It is not work and I'm super passionate about it. And, um, you know, I measure success by, you know, how many people I can help and, you know, I, I just, it, it feels good when I go to work. And so that's, that's my best. That's, that's, yeah. That is awesome. Hey, look, with the OS, we always talk about, you know, loving what you do with people that you love. Um, that's making a significant difference. It's all really important. Cool. So we're going to start with a little bit about your story, because just before we started this podcast, you shared with me something I didn't know about you. And that was the fact that you actually worked with Jack Welsh at GE. Um, yeah, GE. Is that right? I worked. Uh, I worked for the office of Jack Welch, right? right. Yes, uh, yeah. um, uh, on the uh, corporate audit staff and um, on the General Electric management training program. So called, uh, yeah, it was a leadership program. And um, I met the man a couple times, and uh, you know, he's uh, lar- was larger than life. That's for sure. Yeah, and so how was that working? Because that's a huge organization, right? Yeah. Um, it was a great, I mean, I had so many experiences from that, um, huge successes, huge failures. Um, you know, it was, it, as a 20 something year old at the beginning of my career. So, um, there, there, you know, the, the, it was, it was a phenomenal, I mean, I still will die two years younger from that experience because it was, it was, it was, it was, um, you know, hundred hour work weeks, every yeah. other weekend off. Um, so it was, it was a real thing. And, uh, but it was great in that it, it showed me what my capacity was. And, and so I, you know, when later in life starting companies and starting, yeah, it's really good to know how much you have in the tank and, Mm -hmm. and, and that's just super empowering, you know, cause you don't operate that way all the time, obviously, but, when you need to get something done, uh, you know you can draw on something that that most people don't know where you know how much is in their tank. Yeah, fair enough. That's great. So, when did you leave big companies and start your own business? Can you tell us a bit about that um, journey? Well, I mean, yeah, my journey I think was um, is a is a good one. I mean, I I sort of did the intrapreneurial. Um, route where um, I, you know, left big business. I was tired of spending 80% of my time convincing people to do stuff and only 20% of my time actually doing it. I was like, wait, I want to do it the other way around. Um, And so went to Silicon Valley um, and cut my teeth, ended up um, uh, working for a New Zealand company um, called Zcom, um, which at the time was maybe 150 staff and, um, and growing. Uh, I was with them from maybe their, I want to say, pr- just shy of 10 million in revenue up to about 25 or 30 million in revenue. So, you know, experiencing those growing pains at 10 million and another at 25 million, it was, it was, was great experience, but 
um, we ended up spinning a company out of that organization. And that was my first, you know, startup, if you will, you know, and uh, I'd, I'd done one previous in, in Silicon Valley, but, um, you know, I was just an employee. Um, this was, you know, co-founder and um, it was a great way to um, have a safety net below you, I suppose, you know, and, and um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was an outstanding experience. Uh, you know, overall it was, um, I learned so much from that pr process. Okay. What was that company, Kim? Uh, it's a company called umail.com and it's still going. It oh. is an outsourced, uh, it's basically your, your, we don't have the same technology here in New Zealand. Actually, you know what, in New Zealand, um, it just became available on spark, but, um, the ability to read your voicemails and um, and automatically sort of block uh, annoying uh, robocalls, and um, and so it's a tech that you know you download an app called Umail in the in the United States, and yeah. um, um, I think we've got maybe I don't know how many people they have on it now, maybe sixteen, somewhere between fifteen and twenty million users. So um, uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, that's awesome. So that was your first. And you, as you said, yeah. you had the kind of the, a little bit of the safety net of being part of that Zcom spin out. Yeah. Um, what were the things that you kind of learned through that journey? So going from, you know, working within a Silicon Valley company, but under the, I suppose, the protection of being an employee and being paid and then going out on your own as a co-founder. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, the, 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 I'll fast forward because um, I probably did it wrong um, a couple times. Uh, yeah. And then I've, I've learned since then, but it's something that I see a lot of founders doing. And I see it a lot here in, in, in New Zealand. I see it in the States as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's when you try and juggle and do everything. Right. And, and it's, yeah. um, you know, it, 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 you, one of your themes that you talk about is sort of overwhelm and mental health. Right. Mm -hmm. And I got to say like mental health and physical health go hand in hand, but I, I got to say like, you know, better physical health you're, you're in obviously better mental state, but like the more you cannot do as a founder, just getting started, the more headspace you're going to have to focus on the things that really matter. And, you know, I mean, I, I sort of think in those early days of any startup, um, you know, it helps if you, one thing I'll say, it helps if you have a, a, a business partner, like a co-founder, it really helps. It, it only helps if you truly divide and conquer. Um, it only helps if you can truly trust each other, but, assuming that you, those things, and those are big assumptions. Um, but if you can get those right, you know, um, uh, it frees you up to, but even, even two of you might be focusing on, I mean, you know, a day in the life might be, okay, I've got payroll, I've got taxes, I've got uh, a, um, a shareholder agreement to write. I've got um, uh, a, a, a got bugs in my product. I've got kids that have to go to school. I've got uh, a website. Oh, I've got to take a sales call. I've got uh, my partner's birthday. I've got um, an upset beta customer. I've got uh, you know, an, a potential investor who wants a whole bunch of reports from me. Like what? If I don't need it, if I'm not taking a round right now, ignore the investors, you know, um, my CRM is sort of not working properly. I've got an advisor telling me that I have to get a trademark protection and patent. And, you know, I mean, zero won't connect to my bank account. Like all of these things, just all you're juggling them all on the same. And my advice would be like, the thing I learned was just like, <laughs> You don't need a CRM on day one. You don't need uh, an investor pitch on day one. You don't need to, like, don't take the call from an investor if you're not in the process. Like, all of these things are noise. Mm -hmm. Like, follow, 
listen, do you, I'll, I'll put it to your audience to um, um, read the theory of constraints. Fantastic um, fiction book called The Goal by Elia Goldratt. And, and the theory of constraints is imagine a, uh, like a, a manufacturing line and you think of where the bottleneck is in your manufacturing line and you, you solve for that bottleneck. Yep. And what I will just say is like, treat your business, your startup the same way, like ignore everything except the bottleneck <laughs> within reason. And, and, and then when that bottleneck is solved for, it immediately shifts to somewhere else on the manufacturing line and you immediately have a new bottleneck, right? And so then focus on that new bottleneck, but, but try as hard as you can to really just focus on those bottlenecks. And in the early days, that bottleneck is, is, is you know, f- finding the sale, you know, finding a customer who's willing to pay you, yeah. you know, and then find another one to billing pay, you know, and, and, and repeat that process and don't try and boil the ocean um, and, um, you know, prove that you have demand before you go invest incredible amounts building a product. So that's my, that's my, that's what created the gray hair and uh, um, uh, has uh, helped us um, list, honestly turn this company into, um, you know, had we, had we applied um, for the Deloitte Fast 50 that just came out last week, we would have been number 18 on the Deloitte Fast 50. So, wow. um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, we're, yeah, it, it's, I attribute a lot of that to, you know, my team yep. and, and, and just saying no to so many things. Mm. So how many are your team these days, Ken? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's north of 130 at the moment. So. Excellent. Okay. And so, you know, um, <laughs> Back in the early days, yes, you do have to do everything yourself, but over time you build up a team. Have you had any sort of challenges around finding the right people and making sure they're in the right seats doing the right thing? Um, yeah, I mean, um, that's people or everything, um, yeah. particularly in a software company. Um, I would say, you know, the most important thing a founder can do is understand that from the moment that you have the idea and every waking minute from there on out, you are recruiting. (laughs) And, um, you know, 24 seven recruiting and always trying to find people who are, you know, your direct reports that you want on your, you know, that will eventually be managing lots of people, like don't skimp there. Go after world-class talent is what I would say. Like just, just dream big and then go recruit them. And you know what, here's, 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 I mean, one thing I, 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 th- I think we've, we've done well is um, we've been recruiting for roles long, long before we need them. Right. And that is, you know, I mean, six months, I mean, in one of my um, direct reports, I, I knew I wanted that person in that role yeah. and I knew I wasn't going to be able to afford that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, spent a year laying groundwork, having meetings, catching up, telling the story, giving an update, planting the seed, watering it, and, and just making sure it had lots of sun, you know? Uh, And because I knew at some point we were going to need that, that role, it just wasn't appropriate now, but I, you know, I, I set sights on, key key people and then and then you know strategically sort of wound them in to use the the fishing analogy and Mm -hmm. um i think 
you know, hire world-class talent because they're going to be managing the staff. And, 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 and when you get them on your team, get out of their way, let them do their thing, you know? And, um, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's critical. Um, it's, it's critical. And you know what, the other thing I'd say on that subject is, you know, world-class talent can, you know, likely give you eight hours a week that is as productive or more productive than, than 50 or 60 hours a week from somebody who's learning on the job, you know? And so, and, and they may want the extra side job that gives more meaning to, um, you know, uh, a, a career that, you know, might be seeing the end of its cycle, but they don't want to jump, you know, into something new. They want to test it out. Like that is just such a smart way to, to try and attract the right talent out of, you know, large business or medium sized businesses that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, are going to be, this person would be perfect. Well, approach them, you know, tell them your intentions. (laughs) Um, And um, yeah, anyways, that's, that's a, it's just a great way to get, you know, everything you can out of all you got. Yeah. Perfect. So um, how long has Matt Corrective been around for now? Um, John Franich and um, uh, founded the company uh, along with um, Joseph Rakic about, um, well, officially um, six years ago, um, but they spent three and a half years prior iterating on a, on, on the software that later became macroactive. So, you know, we're since inception, we're, we're coming up on, on 10 years. Wow. Okay. So what have been the sort of biggest challenges that you faced, you know, being CEO in the business over that period of time that you've been there, what have been the biggest challenges or opportunities even either or? Um. <sighs> consciously deciding to grow slower than everyone tells you that you should be has been the biggest challenge as CEO. Yep. Um, and I've struggled with it. Um, I've sought a lot of counseling and guidance from, from mentors um, around the world Um uh, um, a mentor out of the States, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, mm-hmm. known, he goes on social, uh, Gary V, um, spent a considerable amount of time um, with him uh, in 2019 uh, that really finally, like a Tetris board sort of um, put put things into place for me. Um, but also, you know, um, a, a number of, a uh, number of people here in Auckland that I meet with on a regular basis. And, um, uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help as, as CEO, it's a lonely job and, um, get, get canceling, you know, get from people who've done it, you know, like be really conscious of who you're listening and taking advice from mm-hmm. is another thing that I would say. Um, I, I've had a, I've had a lot of people in, in non-operational roles um, tell me that we should have been growing faster. Um, and uh, especially in some of the early years, I mean, now we have, everything like the, the concrete's been poured, you know, we can build up, we're growing faster and faster now. And, and so that's, that's exciting. And, and we're, we're able to do that, but um, there were some inflection points where we started growing uh, faster than we could keep up with. And, and um, a lot of non-operational people said, don't worry about it. Just keep on going. Da 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 you know, and, and I'm, I'm really glad that we did it the way we did in hindsight, um, because we, we established a heap of credibility around our brand with our client base. And, and that, that goes on to help you. I mean, um, more than half of our business has come from, from referrals and, um, you know, we have competitors that have raised, you know, 
nine figures that are eye-watering and um and yet day after day we have customers new customers joining macroactive and our our sister company affluencer why because and they're coming to us from our competition why because we you know we've taken the time to you know grow at a pace that doesn't put our clients in the back seat you know and and that's uh and that's something you know we're really proud of but to answer your question it's is an incredibly difficult decision to make yeah and what has been the sort of the consequence of, I mean, obviously you, you mentioned sort of, you know, being able to do better customer service and whatnot. Um, yeah. Has it had any negative effects to actually, you know, stick to that decision and move forward with it? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, uh, listen, if thankfully we're self-funded um, to date, I mean, actually we've, we've taken some, some internal rounds um, and a, uh, um, made two acquisitions. Um, and so some money came into the company uh, 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 via our second acquisition, but, um, uh, but l- like no traditional VC rounds, right? Yeah. Um, had we been in that situation, I think there would have been a lot of pressure to, to just stay, s- stick there. Um, you know, our, our, our early years growth rates are probably not, w- you know, on par with maybe uh, your typical Silicon Valley company. But listen, in the last three years, we've averaged a growth rate of 120, 120%. So um, not to be know, sniffed at, <laughs> not to be sniffed at. So, you know, it's, it, you know, yeah, I mean, some years less, some years more. So, you know, it's, it's, um, but it, it's, it's still, you know, it's still a, it's still a growth rate that we're proud of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And um, from a CEO perspective, you, know, we, you talked at the very beginning a little bit about sort of potential overwhelm and getting stressed out. How do you deal with that in your role? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I focus on the bottleneck and I let, I, I have a line, I say, let fires burn. And it's, you know, it's okay if some fires burn, if they're not on the bottle, if they're not on the bottleneck, but um, I think my, my staff knows when something's the bottleneck because I have, uh, uh, I give it a lot of attention. I'm sort of all over it. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the, that's the secret, you know, it's the theory of constraints and it frees up just so much mental headspace to, to, to be creative and think about, um, um, you know, non-linear forms of future growth. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's my, my job is three things. It's, it's people, it's numbers and it's culture, you know, it's finding the right people. It's, it's answering the question who, not how Um, it's, it's, you know, making sure that people love where they work and, um, and that we're all coming to work for the right reason. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, and then there's enough cash in the bank and the numbers are right. <laughs> you, know, <so>. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound all so simple. That's great. <laughs> so it, it, throughout your kind of career, has there been one thing that has really stood out as a lesson? Cause we, we talked before we came on the podcast about learning from our mistakes and how we take that forward. What's been that sort of biggest learning for you that you've now taken forward and would recommend people, you know, do something different to make sure they don't go down that same rabbit hole. Um, I've got two things. Right. Um, one is, and it, it sounds so overused, but it, boy, is it important. And it's mm-hmm. just really understand and know and define your why. And my challenge to your audience is to, um, ask themselves or try and write down a word, a single word that resonates so much with you that that word could answer the reason why you were put on this earth. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and so, and, 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 and it, it's going to be a different word for every person. Right. Mm-hmm. But, but then 
really ask yourself, am I, am I going to work and living by this word? <laughs> and, and if you're not, um, you're swimming upstream, right? And if you are, it legitimately feels like you are swimming downstream. It is the coolest feeling in the world. And I have done both. And I can tell you hand on heart, swimming downstream is a lot easier and more fun. <laughs> Much okay? more enjoyable, that's right. Um, okay. Um, so, um, you know, I, it, is, it is profoundly impacted my overall happiness in life. And, um, and yeah, and I, I just, I recommend it for everybody. Um, the second thing that, you know, big, big takeaways that I recommend, I mean, huge takeaway is this, um, the, the core team that you start with your co-founder or your, um, your, you know, your, your first hires, you know, um, make sure that your values are entirely aligned. Make sure that, um, there are really clearly spelled out like no asshole rules, like, like you gotta, you, and, and the reason I sort of say, um, values is because it's like a marriage. I mean, like you, you, you can, you're going to have ups and downs, like that's going to happen. Right. And so just as in, you know, a successful partnership or marriage, you know, you don't have ups and downs. If your values are not aligned when the downs come and they will come, yeah, it, things are going to wobble. And, and I just, can say like, like a cornerstone to the success of our company is, you know, John and I are so aligned on those sorts of core values that like the reason we're coming to work is very clear and we're super aligned on it. Right. And, and it just has made the tough days just, so much easier, you know, it's like, okay, well, we got each other's back. And I'll tell you what, like that alignment of values is, it, it is, it's one of the core ingredients, I believe in building trust. And if you don't have absolute com complete trust with your founder or your first hires, those people like, you know, um, it just makes it really hard when things, you know, come unstuck you know, as they do, right? Because you know, businesses do not just grow, you know. It's um, never a straight line, you know. Right. We've all seen that meme where you know the business grows like that, and um, and and you know if you have a really solid foundation with those early early people, um, it just makes it so. And and here's the here's the lesson, and here's here's sort of what I would do different in 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 life is like. There is a time where you might be, you might be thinking, listening to this right now going, oh man, geez, I kind of know that person's not the right person or, you know, or whatever. And, and it might be a thing where you're, your shareholders, you know, you're both, you're both in it together. I will tell you this. It's like, walk away from it. It's going to be another idea. Idea is 1%. Execution is 99%. Right. It's like, like, you know, if you guys are not on the same page, um, yeah, the execution is going to go wrong later on down the road. And it's going to be exponentially more difficult to unwind yourself when you've had investors and you've had all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's um, like definitely, you know, those, those two, those two lessons, I, I, you know, it's like, know your own why, define it in a single word. Um, and then in your partner, gosh, you know, it's just make, make, um, make sure that you guys, you know, you have, you have a, a circle of trust that's unbreakable.
Yeah, I think we're talking from the same page. I mean, it, as you said, it's just like a marriage. And in fact, often we spend more time at work than we do at home. So it's it's um, even more important in some respects that you actually do have that trust and that you share the same values. I've actually worked with clients where they've taken on board an investor because they needed to for the money. They didn't make sure the values actually aligned. And then as a consequence, you've got two parties pulling in completely opposite directions. And it's just not sustainable. Happens um, all the time. Yeah. So I think we've both been there as well, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ken, that's, that's been really awesome. Thank you so much. You've given us so much gold there. I've got at least five tips here for the, for the um, listeners. Just from a, uh, a finishing up point of view, tell yeah. us a bit about Macroactive. Tell us what your ideal client is like. You know, who do you love to work with? Uh, right. Well, Macroactive helps um, creators in this new creator economy uh, build a business and deliver essentially what are uh, digital products via their own completely white labeled app. Um, it's think of it as like a business in an app. Yeah. And, um, and so we are a platform that enables those creators to um, deliver. We've focused very, very intentionally for um, the last five years on a single vertical within the creator economy, which is the health and fitness industry. Um, we're now years later taking on different verticals, but the, the ideal client is someone who has an audience on social media mm -hmm. and uh, is trying to turn that audience into paying subscribers, um, but don't want to sell posts for money, which ultimately just degrades their influence, right? Yeah. Um, they know they want to offer their own product, their own advice. And so our, our platform allows them to offer mindset, nutrition, and training programs uh, that are highly individualized to each person. So uh, if you have injuries or allergies, uh, you know, someone can provide a meal plan um, where you know, meals with recipes that have ingredients that you're allergic to just don't show up to, but uh, inside of their plan. But, but those plans can allow their customers to hit their goal. That might goal might be lose weight. It might be build muscle. It might be get better at rugby. Um, one of our clients is uh, uh, the ex Welsh rugby captain, Sam Warburton. Uh, yeah, he's, you know, he has skills and drills, strength and conditioning, uh, um, uh, um, speed and agility, like all different types of programs can be delivered inside of his own app. And now, you know, uh, we, we, we have hundreds of thousands of end customers uh, paying our trainers a monthly fee to get uh, access to a program that grows and evolves as they grow and evolve on the program. So. Perfect. So if people want to get hold of you, um, find out more about the company, I'm assuming it's macroactive.com. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yep. And if they wanted to have a chat with you, how would they get hold of you, Ken? Um, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn, Ken Brickley. You know, and um, and uh, but and, and you can find me through the website as well. So macroactive.com. Um, we are uh, always looking for uh, people in the creator economy that first and foremost want to impact more people's lives. Uh, our vision and mission is very clear. It's on the wall. It's in the first two minutes of every single one of our meetings, and that's to build a healthy, healthier, and happier world. And we're set out doing that by helping our trainers grow their businesses and scale their impact. Fantastic. Hey, look, I wish we had more time because you and I, I, we could talk all day. Um, but yeah. I wanted to just say that, you know, that has been absolutely phenomenal. The, the information that you've shared there is great. Hey, well done on the growth that you're achieving and, you know, thank the you. continuing to, to, to get better and better. And um, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Deborah. Oh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Ken. Yes, thanks.